Good afternoon. Great to be here and to talk about what is emergency medicine and how it's important. And as mentioned, um, I founded Stanford Emergency Medicine International in 2000. And for the past 15 years, we've been working around the world with our partners, advancing medical education, fostering systems development, studying our interventions both before and after, and also encouraging innovation in low resource settings. And I want to take you back two years to a summer project with some Stanford medical students in rural Cambodia where we were studying the epidemiology of the kinds of emergencies that would present to this hospital when we saw this. And I want to tell you, this is a, a patient footage that I have permission to show you, but it really demonstrates something that's very important that I'm going to be discussing today. So here we go. This is a rural hospital. And this is a young lady who's very sick, who's being brought to the hospital, not in an ambulance, but by her family members. And she's sandwiched between her mother and the driver. And then two bystanders come to get her and bring her into the hospital. Very different than if you were sick in Seattle or near Stanford and needed emergency care. And that's because for those of us who travel the world and get to go to these wonderful developing countries, what we don't realize is their concept of emergency care doesn't exist and it's not the same as ours. There is no ambulance or there are very few ambulances to take sick patients to the hospital. So you have to resort to cramming onto a motorbike or getting into a taxi and you can't get medical care on the way to the hospital. Or as you can see, once she arrived, there was no emergency department. There was no staff waiting to receive her. Their sense of urgency about intervening right away just didn't exist in stark contrast to the way we care for patients in the US. So what is emergency medicine? My specialty. Emergency medicine is a distinct medical specialty. It's about 50 years old, so it's about three years older than I am where we take care of anyone, regardless of gender, regardless of age, with anything, heart attack, fever, motor vehicle accident. This is an image of a motor vehicle accident victim coming into the Stanford ED, and you can see how we're ready to care for that patient and give expert care. And then we deliver that expertise, that emergency medical expertise, whether it's the weekend, whether it's a weekday, whether it's two in the morning or eight in the morning, it doesn't matter, it's the same 24 seven. And the reason that this specialty developed really was the discovery that the sooner you attended to a problem, a medical problem, the better the patient's chance of recovering or doing well. And that's true if you're administering CPR or chest compressions to a patient, you improve their chances of surviving by getting shocked. So they're, if they get defibrillated or shocked, their chance of their heart restarting is greatly increased. And this has translated into, if you're in a shopping mall or an airport, seeing automated external defibrillators or AEDs there because we know if a bystander can put that on a patient who's in cardiac arrest, their chance of living goes up dramatically. If you're having a stroke, which means you're not getting enough blood to your brain or a heart attack, you've got a blocked blood vessel in your heart, the sooner we can open up that blood vessel, the better chance you have of making a recovery and even living. If you're the victim of a trauma accident, like a motor vehicle accident or stabbing, or if you're a woman who's just given birth to a baby and you're bleeding, the sooner we can stop that bleeding, the better chance you have of living. And finally, if you're suffering with sepsis or an overwhelming bacterial infection, the sooner we can give you antibiotics and fluids, the better chance you have of living. And this whole notion of sooner is better really led to the development of emergency care in the US, and that really took the form of two distinct specialties. The first being emergency medical services, popularized by a show that I watched when I was a little kid, Emergency, which followed two paramedics through Los Angeles County, and then a show where I was actually followed by the writers while I was a resident at UCLA, ER, which really encouraged and sort of taught to American public about what we did in the emergency room and inspired a generation of medical students to want to be emergency physicians. 
And this was all based on this concept of the chain of survival, that there are links that go together, there's a continuum of care, and that you are part of that continuum. If I were to collapse right now, I bet you a whole bunch of cell phones would come out, you dial 911, that is the first part of emergency care, calling for help. Delivering first aid, or CPR, is the next chain in the, or link in the chain of survival. And then an expert arriving on an ambulance, basically bringing the hospital to the bedside or to the roadside where there's an accident, and transporting the patient and providing treatment is the next link. And then finally, it's the hospital itself. The emergency department with board certified specialists, the intensive care unit, the operating room, that whole setup that takes you from making that phone call for 911 to getting taken care of and surviving, whether it's your heart attack or car accident or sepsis or whatever. And by coincidence or not, we happen to be in Seattle, which has one of the best EMS, if not the best EMS system in the world. In 1974, Morley Safer, who was on 60 Minutes, said, if you're going to have a heart attack, have it in Seattle. And the reason for that was because if you called for an ambulance, that ambulance would be here within minutes. They're famous for getting here really quickly. And when they arrive, they are experts at cardiopulmonary resuscitation. And so they increase your chance of surviving something as terrible as a heart attack or cardiac arrest. But in that same way that we're able to save so many lives, that we make it look routine on a daily basis, that isn't the case throughout much of the world. Throughout much of the world, disease entities that we can take care of here lead to death and disability on a daily basis. And the reasons for that are lack of organization, poor infrastructure, and inadequate education. And what I have depicted here is the unfortunate inside of a pediatric hospital in Karachi, Pakistan, which was receiving patients after their flooding incident a few years back. And having seen these pictures and having wanted to work there, we decided to go and see if we could help. So a summer ago, we set up a study to understand the kinds of emergencies that they were seeing at the largest children's hospital in Pakistan and Karachi. We enrolled over 1,200 pediatric patients, and what we found was astonishing, that by 14 days, 10% of these children were dead. I can tell you in my 22 years of practicing as a physician, in the one week I was there last December, I saw more children die than in my entire career as an emergency physician in the United States. Devastating. So it makes you wonder, is, is it hopeless? What can we do to help these countries? In fact, it's not hopeless. There's a lot of hope and there's a lot of opportunity because with just some very simple interventions, we can save thousands of lives every day. And that includes what we've been able to do in Nepal, assisting their first ambulance service, the Nepal Ambulance Service, getting off the ground and training their first EMTs. In India, setting up the first paramedic training program so that they had the skills to arrive like they do here in Seattle at the patient's bedside and save lives. And in Cambodia, where we're currently working on a USAID-funded grant to improve maternal and pediatric emergency care, and I want to take you back to Cambodia. I started with this case and I want to finish it. Here is this patient who I was watching arrive at the hospital limp and lifeless. And I'll tell you, when I looked at her, I said, this poor lady is dead. I came there. I was doing a research project. They said, you're the doctor from Stanford. Can you help us? And I said, absolutely, I will help. And so I rummaged through a back room. I found a bag mass device. I started ventilating this patient more out of mercy than anything else, because I didn't think she was going to live. And I started asking him, hey, do you have this medication? Hey, do you have an IV? Let's do this. And we started resuscitating this young lady. And I was working with the local physicians and nurses. And to my surprise, this is the patient two days later, sitting up, smiling with her mother, and talking to us. Dramatic. And this really taught me three things. Thank you. This, this had a profound impact, not only on the patient who survived and was able to go home, return home with her mother to her husband, it had a profound impact on all those people who were watching me take care of this patient, 
who literally had the life-saving medications and the life-saving equipment, yet didn't have the confidence or the expertise to use it. And now when they see a sick person come, they don't have to turn and run. They can stand their ground and utilize the equipment and try and save lives. And it was also really impactful for me because it really sort of justified and gave purpose to what we're doing globally in terms of trying to save as many lives as we can. Thank you very much.